the last speaker. And Daniel, I describe you as the cherry on top, and here's why. Um, talk to us about how to ensure that our data is machine readable. Um, to explore other ways in which research and publishing process can be improved and automated. Um, so now, Daniel's a data scientist at the University of Pennsylvania and a passionate um, advocate for open science. He's performed large-scale analysis to uncover trends in our industry. For example, Daniel has investigated the time from submission to publication across thousands of journals. What percent of, uh, of scientific literature is on Sci-Hub? You want to know the stats? This is the work that he's done. How preprints are licensed, what bibliographic styles journals have applied over time to, to, to grow and expand. Um, Daniel currently researches human disease and leads the development of Manubot, Manubot? Manubot, nicely done. Um, a, a tool for open scholarly writing, writing on GitHub. But for me, the setup here is he's our colleague, number one. He's our advisor in this regard, number two. But ladies and gentlemen, this is our target audience. This is who we work for in a lot of ways. Daniel Hemelstein. Great. Well, so excited to be here in London. Um, it's been a good time so far, although short. So I've titled my presentation today, The Future of Scholarly Publishing, or Publication Automated, Transparent, and Open. And I did use a QR code, although I guess the adoption isn't great. But this is the first time I've ever tried one, so <laughs> we'll see if I like it. The slides are online, and the QR code just goes to the link you see below the slides. So how I want to think about uh, today is that publishing is far from perfect. And I'll tell a few ways in which you know, I've personally been frustrated, and I think a lot of academics see room for improvement. Uh, but rather than, say, be dejected uh, or, or feel bad that, that we're far, far from perfect, I would say every problem is an opportunity. And if we're looking how we could innovate in the future, uh, where we can grow, where there are new business opportunities, I, I think we should say, what are the pain points now, and let's solve those. And so in a way, the more pain points, the more opportunities. <laughs> Let's start with one major problem uh, scholars face, and that is publishing times. Uh, the time it takes from when you've written up a study to, to when it gets released. Here's a visualization made by Nature News, and the idea is <laughs> there's an academic holding up a manuscript, but it, it took so long to get it published that they're just a skeleton now. And while it varies by field, and it, 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 you know, every experience is different, there is a major problem where scholars need to get their ideas, their work out there uh, to get credit and to move the fields forward, uh, but the publication process can hold that up. And so really, we can split the time from, or, or publication delays into two categories. First, from when a manuscript is submitted to a journal to when it's accepted. Uh, so, so that's the first kind of category. And the second one is from when it's accepted to when it's published. Uh, so this later category is the journal has accepted it, they know they're going to publish it, and how long it takes the journal uh, to publish an article. And I, I think the causes of the time are quite different, so I actually want to talk about them separately. And, and first, we'll talk about the time from acceptance to publication. This shows that time, uh, the trends in that time um, over uh, since uh, the year 2000. Uh, so this middle line here is the median. So of all articles in the PubMed database, which has millions of biomedical-focused articles, it shows that the time, the number of days from acceptance to publication has gone down quite a bit from uh, being over 60 to uh, being now just about 25. And so that's great improvement. A lot of this, I think, is due to um, the advent of online publication, electronic workflows. Uh, but there's still more work to be done because I would argue that we could actually do this in one to two days potentially, it, because I think these workflows can be almost entirely automated. Um, but there has been a lot of progress. Now, we should note that uh, this is a distribution. There are some articles, like up here, that are taking over 100 days <laughs> from when they get accepted 
Actually, I had an article that, we, that took over 100 days, and that's what motivated me to do this analysis. <laughs> and it varies a lot by journal. Um, so the article that I was talking about what, uh, had been accepted to PLOS Computational Biology. And so I, I did this analysis of all these journals that I would consider publishing in, and I guess my luck would have it that you know, I had published in the one that was the slowest at the time. Um, but I think they have now, plus computational biology, improved some of their uh, delays. Uh, but it's interesting that this data is now online. And you can notice, say, eLife here uh, has a bimodal distribution. Uh, and that's because they do provisional publication of just the accepted sort of PDF without the full typesetting. Although I'd argue going forward, you know, we should be able to make the fully typeset article available quickly. So the solution I see here is automation. The question, uh, or, or, or when we've got this right, I, I think when authors submit a manuscript, they should immediately be shown a fully rendered proof. A and if you have a website or a journal system that allows that, then I'd say you're at the place where you want to be in the future, and you've solved the automation problem. Uh, so the idea is that no human inputs are needed to go from what is submitted by an author to the final product. Now, obviously, you'll want some checks to make sure everything is right, but theoretically, you should be able to do it um, immediately. And one nice thing about giving authors the ability to kind of see how their article will be processed is that the authors can fix any mistakes or formatting issues rather than having to go back and forth in emails for weeks uh, to deal with like proofs. Uh, so something I'm excited about is the idea that I call lossless submission. The idea that authors can submit to a journal a file that has all the information necessary to enable automated conversion. And uh, the journal eLife claims that they will be trying this out. Uh, so they're going to accept submissions of reproducible manuscripts in the form of DAR files. Um, so right now, a lot of works are submitted in docx files and uh, LaTeX files. And those are good, but there are some things they lack. Uh, so the question is, going forward, can authors submit something that, that can be entirely um, converted to a published article automatically? And I should say eLife claims are doing this, but um, who knows how easy it will actually be. So another thing I think that's really important is to have a single document. And what do I mean by that? Um, remember back in the day, we, also, we, we used to use Microsoft Word. And you, know, you would start with the Word file, and then you would email it to someone. Uh, they would make some changes. Your collaborators would make some changes. You end up with a pile of Word files. And then maybe you need some other data sets. You start getting zip files. And before you know it, you have hundreds of files in your email, all of the same study <laughs> or manuscript. Which one is the latest? Who knows? Which one is the authoritative one with all of the changes? The, the fact is that no one document has all of the changes. There is no single location. Um, so something like Google Docs, where, every, where there's one source of truth and everyone edits the same document, was a great help here. Uh, so what we need is a single shared source where people can make edits. And maybe that's my edit, and that's my collaborator's edit. And they're occurring all in the same spot. And what I think would be really revolutionary here is if the journal's edits also occurred in the same spot. So when the journal made, say, um, copy editing changes, could that be happening to the same file that the authors could see, preferably in a way where the authors could say, actually, that change doesn't work. Um, or let's try to change it this way. So um, I'm the lead developer of the Manubot project, which tries to tackle some of these project or some of these problems. It's a way of writing uh, your manuscripts using the GitHub platform. If you haven't heard of GitHub, it's a website primarily for hosting source code. Uh, so we're trying to take the workflow people use to make software and apply it to manuscript writing. Uh, so essentially, people are creating uh, text files with their manuscript, and then we automate the creation of the manuscript and uh, the bibliography. 
Uh, one thing about <laughs> uh, this product is that it really is for very tech savvy computational users, so people who, who know how to use GitHub and Git. Uh, but we're trying to develop a lot of the best practices that maybe other systems could then take to the masses. Uh, so feel free to check it out at manubot.org. Uh, and actually, this project, again, was motivated by a need uh, where we were writing a review paper on deep learning. And we wanted to make this review paper and, and kind of write it openly, allow scholars from all over the world to contribute. And the question was how. We didn't quite have a good system to just allow anyone to propose edits and for us to be able to review those edits. Uh, so we made this system of Manubot where we allowed authors to propose changes on GitHub. And over time, starting in 2016, uh, more and more people joined the project. And this shows the number of uh, the amount of text they had contributed over time. Uh, until in the end, I believe 27 people from uh, over a dozen institutions had um, given their input and written sections. and. Uh, I think it was appreciated that we that there was this breadth of input from many authors on this rapidly evolving topic. It was the most viewed bioarchive preprint of 2017 when we posted it. So I guess another thing is, you know, if we make new technologies, are there new applications like massively collaborative uh, authoring? Now I think. The next topic, citations, references, and bibliography, is one of the largest pain points in uh, the author and the journal's experience. And it boils really down to bibliographic busy work. So I, I'm just, uh, I collected a few tweets of frustrated people. <laughs> um, <laughs> This one, Mick Watson said, instead of co-authors using competing and different citation managers, each accessing outdated copies of a paper's metadata, it's rubbish. Um, this person says, there's no justification for reference for reformatting. Why can't we just use DOIs, please? And I think both of these people are on the right track um, and pointing at um, a problem that references and citations and bibliographies are, are more complicated and burdensome than they have to be. Uh, so what I think we should look at are persistent identifiers. Uh, persistent identifier is just a long-lasting, standardized reference to a citable work. You use them all the time. For example, if you put in a URL, that's a type of a persistent identifier. A lot of people are probably familiar with DOIs or digital object, object identifiers. Uh, so kind of the vision here is that the only manual bibliographic step in the publication workflow from authoring to production is when the author chooses which work to cite. So if authors can directly cite persistent identifiers, that should be enough. They shouldn't have to keep track of extra metadata. Uh, they shouldn't have to tell the journal anything else besides what persistent identifier they want to cite. And then the journal can fill it all in. And um, this gets back to what we were talking about before with uh, making nice content for search engine optimization. It's about these links, and a link is really formed by a reference pointing to a persistent identifier. So I, I call this concept citation by persistent identifier, and what does it look like? Uh, if the author wanted to put citations after a sentence, they would write something like this. This is a sentence with five citations, and uh, these citations come from a variety of different sources. So for example, I mentioned DOIs. This first citation here uh, points to DOIs, which are generally registered with Crossref, if people have heard of that. Um, PubMed also is a database of articles and has persistent IDs for um, different articles. Or say, for example, Archive, which is a preprint server, um, has its own ID system. Uh, so there are existing databases. You don't actually have to make any databases. You just have to plug into the existing ones. And then what a journal could do is um, take what was written here and automatically create this bibliography because all this information is already existed in databases. And the journal knows what format they want to apply. There's something called citation style language, which allows you to take kind of the metadata and, and make it into a specific format, such that the author has to do none of this. And there happen to already be thousands of existing CSL styles. So um, you know, if we 
search. There's actually so many journals with science in the name, I can't find the actual journal science, but <laughs> uh, that shows you how many already exist here. So mostly, a lot of this work has already been done for the journals. It's just integrating with it. Uh, so, so the goal is here really to have unambiguous references, to have lossless publishing workflows, easy retrieval of cited work, automated metadata generation, and automated bibliographies, and finally, machine readability. The next major topic I'd like to talk about is that science is a continuous process. But publications are fixed. Uh, what I mean by continuous is that it's ongoing and it's never you know, completely final. Science is really a conversation and over time our understanding of things changes. Uh, but traditionally, you know, publications have been a very concrete unit that's very hard to change. And I'll give a few examples of that. Uh, this was my first paper, my first first author publication in 2011, so I guess an exciting thing for me. Um, well, it was very exciting until I realized that the figures were in the wrong order <laughs> in the paper. And it took from, well, 2011 to 2016 to get an erratum issued. I wasn't working on it you know, continuously, but I would occasionally email the publisher. Um, <laughs> And finally, I ran into one of the publishers at a conference, and then that's what <laughs> got the erratum issued. But um, the point is, this was a very hard and laborious process, and um, not even a, an ideal process, because what the erratum says is, after publication of this article, it has been noticed that figures one and three had been incorrectly reverted in the original article. But how helpful is that? I kind of just want the original article to be fixed. <laughs> you know, like who's going to find the erratum and uh, one page here, oh, swap it around. That's a lot of work. Um, so I think commenting features are potentially a way that journals can add a lot of value. So, um, you know, potentially I could have just left a comment that said these two figures are swapped and that would be helpful. Um, not as helpful as a big fix, but pretty helpful. And I've used this uh, for this study that uh, we published in the journal Pierre J, where I later noticed a mistake in the work. Um, so I was able to comment here and say uh, some of those values, the ones you see in bold, were actually wrong. And I called this the future of uh, core agenda. So a core agenda is when an author makes a mistake and they want to correct it. Uh, so it really reduced the burden. And if we want literature that's accurate, uh, it's very helpful to allow people to fix mistakes or comment on them or have discussion very easily. Another service that allows this uh, and is gaining popularity is Hypothesis. And some journals have integrated it. So for example, this is a figure supplement for my paper. And uh, I put this number here. It turned out after we had published this, some new data came out. And uh, this data was incomplete. So we just made an annotation, uh, which explains why it's incomplete and points readers that there's a newer version. So what we're seeing here is that the publication is still fixed, but by allowing comments, uh, we can point readers to newer information. But how about can publication itself be continuous, such that we have multiple versions of things? Uh, so for one study we did, uh, the Sci-Hub coverage study, uh, we looked at uh, how much of the literature was in Sci-Hub and we posted that as a preprint. Uh, so here you see in the preprint DOI version one, V1 at the end, and we estimated um, this number. Now this number was based on false assumptions about what the data was. Um, and actually, after we posted it, Sci Hub tweeted that we misunderstood the data. Uh, so that's kind of like post-publication peer review, you could say. <laughs> and they tweeted this here. Uh, we had misunderstood that the access logs you know, only had these resolved requests, not just any request. Uh, so then we made a version two of the study. And in that version two, we said in the first version of our study, we mistakenly treated the log events as requests rather than downloads. And um, the cool thing there is that you know when there was a mistake, we could just release another version, and if people just go to the you know main article, they get to the latest version. Uh, but we still note that there used to be a mistake uh, just to avoid any confusion. Um, so I think you know can this is on preprint servers, and that's you know great because preprint servers can keep posting multiple versions. But 
can journals potentially have versioning? And especially, you know, versioning that's intelligent, like versioning that will show you a diff. So you can say what changed between version one and two and see that highlighted. Um, I think, you know, that's something that um, is challenging and that users would really appreciate. Another thing to talk about here is if we have all these versions and if there are these problems of trust that um, earlier talks brought up, um, are there things that journals can do to ensure the integrity of their content? And uh, one thing I think you can do in the future is called time stamping, uh, which is just the idea that you prove that the manuscript existed at a certain point in time. So in academia, um, you know, precedence is often important. And with the timestamp, you can prove that you, know, you had published a work in a certain form at a certain time. Um, and currently, you can do this with something called open timestamps, which times it timestamps uh, any uh, file to the Bitcoin blockchain. And it's free of charge. So uh, this is something that I think you know, all journals could do. And it would put them kind of at the cutting edge of technology to be able to say, hey, for all our authors, we provide this service where we prove that they had published your work at that time. The next problem is insufficient visibility and discovery. Uh, so what do we mean by that? Uh, let's go back to the voice search example. I asked before I came here, find me the scientific article about the 2018 Hawaiian volcano activity. And um, it didn't find me the scientific article I was thinking of in the top three results. This was on my phone. Although, if I phrased it a little bit differently, find me a scientific publication about the Hawaiian volcanic activity, which is actually less specific. <laughs> it doesn't even include the year that the activity was. It, it came up with the paper I was looking for, uh, the science article on it. Um, so it is bizarre. It is sort of a black box. We don't know exactly how it works, but there are recommendations for what you can do um, to make sure that your content is being used you know, as effectively as possible. And what really I think it boils down to is that publishing needs to move beyond the PDF. Um, this is like a visualization from the first force conference, which had the tagline beyond the PDF. Um, so we need to start taking advantage of formats that are structured and machine readable. Uh, and what do I mean by that? If you go and look at a bioarchive preprint today, and then you go in your browser and say inspect source, or, or you just view the source code of that website, you'll see all of this stuff in the HTML head document. And what is this stuff? This is never stuff that is shown directly to the user, but this is stuff that is shown to search engines and robots, essentially, um, to let them know stuff about the page. Uh, so for example, what you see here is information about uh, how to cite the work. This is used for Google Scholar to uh, determine how it will show up. It talks about the authors. It talks about uh, the copyright license um, and the language, other stuff like that. So uh, I guess BioArchive uses Highwire, and they're doing some things right. So that's, <laughs> that's great. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, really, there are always new standards about how we can put more information into HTML documents and um, other types of publication documents. And this is what I think will be essential for voice search. <laughs> Uh, another thing is hyperlinks in manuscripts, uh, because the way search engines and a lot of artificial intelligence work is that they make inferences based on hyperlinks. Uh, so when one work references another, um, and it's actually, you know, when I try to put hyperlinks in my studies, the journals often remove them. And I think that's kind of an outdated practice that we don't need to be doing. We, sh we should encourage you know, scholars to link to things even if they're not you know, traditional citations. And I guess this motivation has been around at least since 2000, because I found this paper, Motivations for Hyperlinking in Scholarly Electronic Articles, a qualitative study. Um, but I found it a little bit ironic that, look at the DOI, um, <laughs> this huge long DOI, which is a persistent identifier with 
uh, parentheses and symbols like that, it's essentially how you should not make a DOI. <laughs> Uh, I don't think any publishers do this still, but uh, this kind of gives you know text mining and m machine processes uh, a heart attack because there's so many things that can make it break. Design simple and robust systems. You know, <laughs> don't put all these characters you know in a DOI. So another big thing about uh, whether your content will be accessible for intelligent agents are its access status. So this is using data from Unpaywall to show trends in the access status of articles over time. Uh, what Unpaywall does is it looks at all articles with a DOI, and then it sees if it can pull up the full text of the article. Uh, so there's a variety of different categories, and this is showing the prevalence over time. Uh, so uh, one main category is closed or toll access. Uh, so if you were to go to uh, the article page outside of an institution, it would not show you the full text um, without, say, logging in or uh, purchasing the article. And um, as we see, you know, recently since about 2000, uh, the percentage of closed access journals, I'm uh, sorry, well, toll access articles has been going down, and it's now, you know, maybe uh, only 60%. Um, but we do expect, I, I think probably a lot of people in this room with changes going on, expect that, you know, we may be at an inf kind of, this curve may accelerate. Uh, so we have to think about this gray area decreasing very quickly. And that actually, I would say, is a very good thing if you're thinking about getting your content uh, to be used into voice search, to be uh, integrated more uh, in, into other resources, because it's very helpful, you know, when the robots and crawlers can access them. Uh, so on the other side, we have gold open access and hybrid and, and bronze content. This essentially means the article is accessible from the publisher's site for free. And uh, there, there's kind of two, uh, a distinction here that's important, and that's whether the article also has an open license. The open license is great, say, if you want the article to be uh, put into a corpus of articles for text mining, uh, which I think uh, that corpus could then be used to power uh, voice search and other types of AI that could drive traffic and visibility to the article. Uh, so I think not only should you make them public, you should probably also put an open license uh, or move towards that. And then there's a sliver of green open access, uh, which is where the article is not free from the journal, but it is free from somewhere else. And I want to say maybe that's the worst case for the journal, because then the traffic goes elsewhere. Um, and the voice search directs users elsewhere. So uh, if you, know, you have a closed access journal, but then a growing proportion of the articles are green, I think you're missing out on the opportunity to really um, make your website and your platform the center of visibility for that content. And so finally now, I want to talk about the most difficult thing to speed up, which is the time from submission to acceptance, which actually is a much longer time than the acceptance to publication. And uh, unlike the acceptance to publication, this time has, or had, this you know, period has not been going down or decreasing over time. Uh, we see it bounces around, uh, and the data here goes back even further from 1980. This is data from millions of articles on PubMed, and so it's taking uh, a median of about 100 days from when the authors submit the article to when uh, it gets accepted. And actually, from an author's perspective, it's, a, it's way longer because you often have to submit to multiple journals, or uh, maybe the first time the journal rejects it, and it resets the clock here. Um, so there's a huge area of opportunity here to speed things up, and if you speed things up, authors will want your platforms. <laughs> Uh, so while overall the trends have been um, stable as specific journals, actually the medians have been increasing uh, for various different reasons. So this is plus one, nature, and cell. And the main reason here is that peer review is a slow process. It takes um, a lot of organization. It is a lot of work. You're asking people who probably don't have enough time <laughs> and uh, to, to review the articles. So uh, it's a very challenging process. I think kind of the main area we can improve here is that no assessment should be wasted. 
that whenever someone assesses an article, could journals use that uh, to make sure they're not repeating the same work over and over again? And uh, what's important here is open peer review. So, so let me explain what I mean. Uh, this is a review I did for a bioarchive preprint. Um, it's kind of, it's very meta because a preprint was tracking the population or popularity and outcomes of all bioarchive preprints and it was posted to bioarchive. <laughs> um, but then I was asked to review it for something called Bio Overlay, which is not a journal, it's just a website that reviews preprints um, regardless of, of any journal. And uh, so I made this review when uh, the editor, Zach Hensel, asked me, and uh, here you can see my review. Actually, what's kind of cool is that uh, people even commented on my review using the hypothesis integration. So we now have reviews and comments on the reviews. It's starting to look like a conversation. It's starting to look like science. <laughs> Uh, so the journal, uh, that preprint then went and was peer reviewed at the journal eLife. And um, what the journal review said is a member of reviewers to lab reviewed the manuscript for the life sciences overlay, bio overlay. The most in important comments in that review are included in the points below. So essentially what's been done here is that the journal review was outsourced to a pre-existing review. And I think journals have a great uh, ability to optimize here to avoid repeated work by finding review that already exists. Uh, the question is, is there a lot of review that already exists that journals can take into account when deciding to accept an article? Uh, this shows the popularity of preprints in the biomedical fields. Uh, you can see a lot of the recent growth has been um, sparked by BioArchive, which is in this purplish color here. Uh, but the point is, it really looks like um, preprints are expanding and, and growing. And while not all preprints get comments, I think there's a big opportunity for um, you know, preprints to, to, to be getting these reviews. And uh, right now, when an article is reviewed and then rejected, oftentimes those reviews disappear. And so I think there's an opportunity for journals to find a system such that those reviews don't disappear and uh, that they can be reused. 